these are some random dermatopathology cases that we're going to look at in this video. Just a few things that I came across recently. And the last uh, random video did uh, so well and people were so interested in it that I thought I'd make another one. So here's a, a shave biopsy from sun damaged skin. You can see that there's a lot of solar elastosis out here, all that blue stuff replacing the pink dermal collagen. And this patient, the clinical history was that they w had a rash uh, that kind of came and went and had these uh, small itchy bumps, little itchy uh, pruritic papules on the trunk mostly. And here's a biopsy of one of these papules. And what you can see right away, you can see how it's a small kind of discrete lesion that would uh, correlate to a small bump on the skin. And there's a lot of fluid that's kind of pushed the epidermis, uh, the epidermal keratinocytes apart. If we go closer, we can see that the reason that fluid is filling the space here, this is not really like spongiosis. In fact, this is the epidermal cells are falling apart. They're becoming acantholytic. And then fluid, this, uh, this is just some serum kind of uh, fluid that seeped up in here and filled in the space. So acantholysis is when the, um, spina, the spinous layer of the uh, epidermis uh, falls apart and basically the, uh, the keratinocytes lose connection with their neighbors. Their desmosomes, those spines that hold them together, kind of get stretched or pulled apart or broken down for a variety of different reasons. And what happens is that the cells become detached and loose. And you can see here it's starting. At the very beginning, it can kind of look a little like spongiosis. But then what happens is the cells break free and the keratinocytes kind of uh, curl up into a little ball. Their cytoplasm gets more dense because they the uh, because it's not stretched as thin, and so they have this rounded kind of very pink appearance, like that. And you can see that where they've become detached from their neighbors, those cells are also kind of rounded and smoothed on the edges. And so that rounding of the cells is because they don't have uh, the tension of being connected to their neighbors and pulled kind of taut by those spines uh, that are that are usually connecting keratinocytes in the epidermis. So that pattern is called acantholysis, and it's really important not just for this disease, which is Grover's disease, we'll talk about in a second, but it's important for a lot of different diseases. That, so it's important to recognize the pattern of acantholysis in dermatopathology. And then additionally, some of the acantholytic cells up here are beginning to die and break down and what's happening is the nucleus instead of being kind of large and open and kind of pale purple has become very dark and like almost dark purple to black in color almost and and very condensed and so these cells this this process is called a dyskeratosis and it kind of looks to me a lot like parakeratosis but when you see it in the setting of of uh, acantholysis we call it dyskeratosis and it takes kind of two main forms. It takes the one form where the cells are kind of thin and stretched out. And uh, those cells are called grains because they kind of look like, I guess, like grains of wheat or, or other types of grain. Uh, uh, old school dermatopathologists had a very active imagination, I think. No offense to them. They uh, basically created this field. But in any case, they came up with a lot of names that sometimes sound funny to modern day uh, derm paths. And then the cells over here that are uh, kind of more rounded are called corond, and that's the my bad attempt at doing the French, which means round bodies. And so uh, grains and corond are the two types of dyskeratotic cells you see. So in this setting, where we have this solitary, itchy little bump with acantholysis and dyskeratosis, and this patient has a history of a rash that's kind of coming and going, particularly on the trunk and itchy little papules. That's a perfect history for Grover's disease or transient acantholytic dermatosis, which often presents as an itchy kind of papular rash, usually on the trunk. Um, and uh, they, they oftentimes will have a little bit of infiltrate underneath them, including some eosinophils. And I kind of speculate that maybe that's part of why they're um, so itchy and bothersome to the patient. So that is uh, Grover's disease. Let's look at one other example of that. So you might think, well, this doesn't look anything like that case I just showed you. And in fact, it is kind of a different, more subtle pattern of Grover's disease, but I see this often and I think it's good to recognize because sometimes you'll kind of just catch these changes a little bit on one section and if you cut deeper, you'll find it. So anytime they're looking uh, clinically for folliculitis or something with a kind of itchy, papular, bumpy little rash, I always keep Grover's disease in mind because it can be tricky to find. But here, the clues the most important clue is look at the granular layer. The granular layer is very thick and very hyper um, hyperchromatic, it's very purple. So look over here at the normal skin. The granular layer is a very thin little purple line with these purple keratohyaline granules. 
It's a very thin layer of purple granules in one or two cells, kind of uh, thick at the top of the spinous layer. It divides the spinous layer from the corneal layer. But when you get over here, that layer gets very thick and you have lots of enlarged cells with big, thick purple granules. You can see those increased uh, granular layer in a lot of different processes, but when I see it as a little focal area, particularly when I start to see some stuff that looks like parakeratosis or maybe dyskeratosis, and I start to see some cells that are starting to fall apart and get acanthalytic, to me that's a good sign that you're dealing with growers. And if you cut deeper, a lot of times you'll see it. I think though, honestly, in the right setting, even changes like this are compatible with Grover's disease in my, um, in my um, um, opinion. And down here in the dermis, again, look at this little infiltrate of lymphocytes underneath the lesion. And again, often if you go closer, you'll find occasional um, eosinophils. You don't have to have them, but you'll often find them. Maybe this one doesn't have any. And look, we cut a little deeper and what happens? You're starting to see the cells falling apart and rounding up and becoming acanthalytic. And then they're starting to turn to die and turn into dyskeratotic cells, the, the core rond right here, and then some little grains up there. So another more subtle example of Grover's disease. All right, so let's uh, show something different. This is an ulcerated lesion from uh, the ear of an elderly patient. And uh, right here what we see is really thickened epidermis with a little bit of scale and crust on top, serum and parakeratosis. So the first thought that I had when I see this on the ear, an ulcerated uh, nodular lesion is chondrodermatitis nodularis helicis. And that's a kind of a reactive condition where that can mimic a squamous cell carcinoma clinically. It can look like a little um, ulcerated red uh, bump or nodule on the ear, often on the helix or the anti-helix. And the thought is that it comes from ischemic change from pressure. Um, it's usually in older pa patients and the, the pressure causes ischemia and the cartilage starts to die and the dermis starts to die in a focal area underneath the skin. And then you get reactive epidermal hyperplasia. So that was my first thought. But this is one of those times where I I'm not so sure that I'm right. So here you can actually see there's cartilage, but we have some other unusual changes. And although I'm not exactly sure why this is happening in this particular case, I think there's a couple uh, interesting microscopic points. So I wanted to share it anyway. So here we do see that there's necrosis over top of the skin and it goes down all the way to the underlying cartilage. So this is the cartilage, the hyaline cartilage of the helix. And you can see how it's got uh, areas at the edges where it's kind of pink and the cells are starting to die, so it's becoming, oops, it's becoming degenerated and partially necrotic. So all of that would fit well with CNH, but the, the couple of things that don't fit well with con chondrodermatitis nodularis helicis is this. We've got huge uh, um, uh, collection of neutrophils, these little tiny kind of multi-segmented nuclei. Those are neutrophils and they are breaking down and being destroyed and turning into karyorectic debris or nuclear a dust. So this, this finding here is almost like an abscess. So I've personally never seen a case of a CNH that became abscessed before, although I suspect that perhaps that's what's happening in this case. And when we look around a little bit more, we find in fact that this is an infectious process, at least partially. Now, whether the infection caused the process or is a secondary phenomenon, it's hard to say. But when you look, these little purple nodules here, these are colonies of cocci bacteria. And they're a little bit hard to get to show on, um, on a video, but let's try. When I focus in and out, you can see that this little collection is composed of tiny, tiny little dots. Those little dots, each of those little tiny dots is a cocci bacteria. They show up a lot better on, under the microscope than they do on a video. And here's another, you can see them when they're a thinner layer down here. Each little dot represents a bacteria. So bacteria are, um, are quite a bit smaller than white blood cells. See, the neutrophils are much more massive than each of these little tiny dots of bacteria. And you can see that there's layers, uh, there are a little collections and uh, colonies of cocci bacteria right up here against the cartilage. So it's kind of interesting. It's a, an infectious um, abscess. Uh, by cocci organisms, probably these, because this is in the skin, good, most likely these are staph or strep, but of course there's no way to tell on, uh, on microscopic exam. The uh, tissue would have to be cultured uh, to figure out for sure what type of bacteria it is. So in a case like that, I just described what I found and, and said that there's an abscess with some necrotic cartilage and there are lots of bacterial colonies and that uh, it appears at least partially this is 
either a secondary infection or this is the primary process and they need to do um, some cultures uh, to figure out what kind of bacteria is causing this. So kind of an unusual case, but very, uh, very uh, beautiful histologic details. And then over here, you can see these enlarged vessels. And uh, in the background, there's some enlarged kind of hyperchromatic cells that even look a little bit atypical. But these are actually, uh, this is granulation tissue, so kind of a reactive tissue repair change that's uh, it's basically early scar formation that's happening around the abscess. You've got these large, uh, or these uh, dilated capillaries that have thicker walls and they have plump endothelial cells. And then in between, you have a mixture of inflammatory cells and plump myofibroblasts. And sometimes granulation tissue can get kind of robust and scary looking. I actually did a few stains here to make sure that this wasn't a subtle, um, poorly differentiated cancer infiltrating the tissue but all of those were negative. So it's kind of a robust granulation tissue response right next to this uh, abscess with bacteria and ulcer and necrotic cartilage. So here's a nodule on the, um, the uh, arm of a patient, and it was clinically thought to represent either a cyst or lipoma or some other sort of uh, skin tumor. Uh, and what you can see actually is it's this large uh, nodular aggregate of cells with uh, dead material in the middle, this dead pink stuff. And looking closer, these cells are histiocytes. And in particular, not just regular histiocytes, but actually multinucleated giant cells. And the reason the multinucleated giant cells are there is because there's foreign material. Each of them, you can see they're ingesting little fragments of pink stuff. So that's dead keratin material. So keratin is great on the surface of our skin, but once it gets down in our dermis or our deeper tissues, the body does not tend to like it very much. And the immune system is activated against it and usually forms this really intense foreign body granulomatous response to try to remove the keratin. So each of these little spaces here, these are from where keratin, some of it's kind of washed out or, or fallen out during processing and cutting. But these are each multinucleated um, giant cells and which are basically a form of histiocyte or a macrophage, and they're trying to clean up this keratin debris. And that's uh, just a really extensive, exuberant uh, foreign body reaction to keratin. So usually when you see this, it's because there's been a ruptured cyst um, or hair follicle nearby. This is a pretty exuberant example of a granulomatous, or we can call this a keratin granuloma if you wanna have a name to give it. And here in the middle, all this dead stuff, this isn't necrotic tumor or anything worrisome like that. Instead, see all these little flaky things? Those are all dead keratin uh, flakes, just like you'd see on the surface of the skin. So again, this is the, what you would see in the middle of a, a follicular cyst in the skin, or what people sometimes call epidermal inclusion cyst, or uh, surgeons call incorrectly a uh, sebaceous cyst. So I, I'm not trying to point out the surgeons, but I think they're the only people that I see ever say, oh, it's a sebaceous cyst. It's not actually anything to do with sebaceous glands. So all of this is histiocyte, and look, ah, there we go. When we look around, you can find here's the cyst. And the cyst is lined by a uh, stratified layer of squamous epithelium, just like the skin surface. You know, if you didn't know any better, I could tell you that this was the top of a skin biopsy, but it's actually down deep in the uh, dermis here. So this is a stratified squamous epithelium. It's benign and it's got nice, loose, flaky keratin over the top of it. And so that keratin in the middle of the cyst, you can see it better from low power, all that stuff from the middle, if the cyst ruptures, it spills out into the dermis, the surrounding tissue, and then creates this uh, really robust host response. So keratin granuloma from a ruptured cyst. So at first glance, you could think that this is another example of a ruptured cyst. There's so much flaky keratin here and detached fragments of, of dead keratin, but there's actually some tissue here. And this is really a big shave biopsy of a large, uh, scaly, uh, thickened area. And so from low power, when I see something like this with the epidermis really pushing way down and kind of sending little uh, extensions down into the dermis, that really worries me for squamous cell carcinoma. But you always have to be really careful because reactive squamous epithelial changes, what we call pseudoepitheliomatous um, hyperplasia, the, those kinds of reactive changes of the epidermis can be seen in a variety of conditions and they can really closely mimic squamous cell carcinoma. So it's a, there's a tendency to sometimes overdiagnose it as squamous carcinoma. You can see those changes in the setting of different inflammatory conditions or reactive conditions. And you can also see it in the setting of uh, some infections like leishmaniasis, uh, blastomycosis, other types of uh, deep fungal infections have a tendency to get 
uh, reactive epidermal changes, and a variety of other things too, of course. And when we look closer, you can see actually this is indeed a reaction to something. And right here, look, there's pigment in the dermis. And I want you to pay close attention to the color of this pigment. This pigment is not brown, it is black. So although melanocytic lesions and a lot of other things on the skin surface look black to the naked eye, when you go microscopically, you'll find that they are always some shade of brown or yellow or orange. Our bodies can make a variety of different pigment colors, particularly brown, which is what melanin is, and it can make some different variations of reddish orange color, but our body cannot make black pigment. If you find black, truly black pigment somewhere in the body, it is almost always from outside the body. I can't think of any instance where it's from inside the body. And there's a variety of different things, you know, uh, that you can see this from. You can see it from amalgam, from dental fillings that happen to get um, implanted into the gums or the, the oral mucosa. You can see this black stuff in the lungs, which is carbon. That's from breathing in uh, pollutants in the air, particularly if you live in big cities. But almost all of us have a little bit in our lungs. You can see it from different types of metal that gets deposited in the skin. Some people drink colloidal silver because they believe it has magical health uh, properties and I would, I would advise against that. It's uh, probably not a good idea because what it'll do is turn your skin uh, blue looking because it'll put black pigment in there that then makes the skin look blue um, to the naked eye. But this is none of those things. This is something much more common. And this is actually tattoo pigment. So this pigment was put here on purpose. That's black tattoo pigment. And then you can see there's a really robust, brisk inflammatory response. Lots of lymphocytes and uh, histiocytes and dilated blood vessels. So there's granulation tissue here and scar formation. Really, uh, the body's very unhappy with the tattoo pigment in this particular case. And if I can find it, ah, here it is. This is not uh, just a black tattoo. This is a multicolored tattoo. And this is red tattoo pigment. Yeah, this really bright red, it's kind of granular um, on, under the microscope. It's hard to get that to show up on a video. I'm going to try to here. You can kind of see it's re refractile and red. So that's red tattoo pigment. And red tattoo pigment tends to be the one that is most likely to cause uh, an allergic um, kind of uh, an allergic response to the tattoo or an immune response to the tattoo. It doesn't do that for everyone, of course, but uh, it is the most common offender. And red tattoo pigments are often made from uh, cinnabar, which is a uh, kind of uh, the ore that mercury um, is made from. So it's different than metallic mercury, but it is related to mer mercuric compounds. But in any case, it tends to stimulate the immune system a lot in some people. And uh, in the uh, clinical history was that this patient had a tattoo and it was the red areas of the tattoo in particular that were getting really inflamed and they were getting thick and scaly because the epidermis was overgrowing and reacting to the underlying uh, dermal inflammatory change. So I don't see this very often, but I, from time to time we'll see really extensive um, tattoo reactions. <laughs> And uh, sometimes they can, I mean, really, they can mimic a squamous cancer. I've seen one that had really abundant uh, lymphocytes going into the epidermis that looked like mycosis fungoides. And obviously, with the history, it's real easy to avoid those problems but, um, or those misdiagnoses. But uh, look, keep your eye out for tattoo pigment. That's what black tattoo looks like and red tattoo. And this case is a, a particularly um, a, uh, exuberant example of a tattoo reaction. So I'm not saying you can't get a tattoo. That's a between you and your doctor and your tattoo artist, but do keep in mind that occasionally they have side effects. All right. Here's a nice uh, example of a seborrheic keratosis. There's kind of this thickening of the epidermis and it's covered by orthokeratin, not parakeratosis. And you could draw kind of a, a, a line right underneath it. It's kind of, a, or run a string underneath it from one end to the other. It's got a very flattened bottom. That's a helpful clue for seborrheic keratosis. And I cover the features more in one of my other videos. And you tend to see these little horn pseudocysts. Here's another one over here. Those are nice clues for seborrheic keratosis. So no problem, right? Well, you can see that there's someone's used the marker to, to um, point out something on the slide. And so that's always a good clue. Unfortunately, slides do not come to us in the pathology lab pre-labeled like this. Uh, we have to still look at them without anyone, um, 
without any marks uh, coming that show us where the cancer is. But here's a really subtle example of a tiny little superficial basal cell carcinoma who's kind of hitchhiking a ride underneath this seborrheic keratosis. Now, this is probably a, just an incidental finding and has probably been cured just by this shave biopsy. I imagine this won't cause any problems for the patient. But it's an important point to remember that just because you find one diagnosis on a slide doesn't mean that you should stop looking. Um, I always try to keep my eyes open for subtle melanoma in situ at the edge of a, of a basal cell carcinoma biopsy or little areas of basal cell carcinoma in biopsies or excisions for other things. But you can see these cells have a little bit more atypia, kind of a basaloid appearance, some palisading around the edges. And they've got that clefting artifact and that kind of a loose mucinous stroma underneath. So basal cell carcinoma, uh, kind of hitching a ride underneath a big benign seborrheic keratosis. All right, here's uh, something else that looks a little bit like a seborrheic keratosis and may in fact be uh, related depending on your point of view. This is a solitary lesion from the face and it's a shave biopsy. And you can see that it's got that pink appearance that's kind of like a seborrheic keratosis made of pink keratinocytes. You can see some areas that look like horn pseudocysts that are filled with orthokeratin. But this uh, lesion, instead of having kind of the flat bottom that most seborrheic keratoses have, it really pushes down. You can see that it's kind of, uh, uh, kind of pushing down with a kind of cup or bowl shape. Here you can see it again. It's uh, pushed up uh, above the epidermis, but also is kind of bulging down into the dermis. And um, although the first uh, part that we saw over there was, uh, was kind of cut across the bottom, you can actually see the base of the lesion here on this uh, section. And it looks like it's got a smooth border and no infiltrative growth, so that's helpful. And when you look closer, um, a lot of some of the spaces are artifactual, unfortunately, but when you look uh, closer here, what you find is this really unusual pattern. The keratinocytes are making these little tiny whirled balls. You can see that each individual keratinocyte cluster, they're kind of swirled together in these little balls or whirls. And these are called squamous eddies. And you can see these in irritated seborrheic keratoses, but when you see something that looks like a seb and it's pushing down into the dermis with kind of a cup-shaped or bowl-shaped um, kind of uh, profile, and then it has lots of these uh, squamous eddies, the other thing you can think of is what's called an inverted follicular keratosis. And the reason it's called that is it tends to be centered on hair follicles. And I think that's probably what we're seeing right here is a portion of the follicle that's kind of been replaced by this tumor. Or maybe even here, maybe there's kind of more than one uh, branch of the follicle that's, that's got this tumor growing in it. And these are benign tumors. Uh, and the biggest problem I think with them is that occasionally they can get some reactive atypia and oftentimes on a shave biopsy they're transected at the bottom, you can't see the base. So in an old sun damaged person I always worry a little bit, could this maybe be a squamous carcinoma? And um, if I um, am uncertain or I feel there's kind of some atypia there, I might occasionally say, well keep an eye on the patient and if it grows back then you need to go biopsy it again. Or if I'm really worried I'll tell them, well I just really can't tell and uh, please do a small re-excision. So that's how I handle that issue. Everyone has their own way of addressing um, atypia and uncertainty when we run into them in derm path. But um, I try to be as definitive as I can, but sometimes we just can't know if we can't see the whole lesion. But these are really pretty. I really like these, uh, these kind of squamous whorls and eddies. And um, I think that's a very, a very beautiful pattern that you can see where the squamous cells kind of swirl around. And it could get confused potentially, I guess, with, um, with keratin pearls that you often see in squamous cell carcinoma. The biggest difference is that here, these little whorls and balls are in the middle of the tumor itself. They're kind of up in the epidermis or in the protrusion of the tumor from the epidermis, whereas keratin pearls in squamous cell carcinoma um, usually are kind of individual invading nests of keratinocytes down in the dermis, kind of separate from the main tumor mass. But again, look at that. You can just see each one of these each one of these little discrete swirls or whirls or eddies of keratinocytes. So again, from low power, uh, kind of looks like a seb, but growing down, often centered on a kind of a follicular opening here and has those little um, squamous eddies, inverted follicular keratosis or IFK, as we often abbreviate it. We like to abbreviate names in Dermpath. All right. Now this is another biopsy from a single lesion on the face and it's a little bit pale, I apologize, but I think it's a pretty good example. What you can see here is that there are zones of very pale, almost clear cells that are filling up the whole epidermis. 
and kind of pushing down um, down hair follicles and down the sweat ducts and other adnexal structures. So these clear or pale cells, we have to figure out what they are. They're not normal. Let's look up here. And then in addition to them filling up the whole epidermis in some places, they also have this tendency to scatter and spread upwards towards the skin surface. So we refer to that as pagetoid spread, and the reason for that is that it's similar to what we see in Paget's disease of the nipple, which is breast cancer that grows up through the epithelium of the, of the duct and out onto the skin surface of the nipple, and it's actually intraepithelial cancer. And you can also see Paget's disease in the skin um, away from the nipple, and that's usually in the genital or anogenital region, so we call that extra mammary pagets. So other things that have that same scattered, you know, single scattered um, atypical cells that are spreading up into the epidermis, it, there are three main things and then a few others, but the three main things are Paget's disease, whether of the nipple or extra mammary, looks pretty much the same. Number two, melanoma. Melanoma often has pagetoid spread of melanocytes. And then number three, squamous cell carcinoma. And so we, we see these things a lot where we have a biopsy with pagetoid spread. By far the most common thing I see pagetoid spread in is actually squamous cell carcinoma. But a lot of people forget this. They focus on pagets and melanoma. But uh, squamous cell carcinoma, at least in my patient population of older uh, white patients who've been sun damaged, many of them, uh, we see squamous cell carcinoma so much more commonly uh, even though we do see quite a bit of melanoma, actually. So when you have pagetoid things, you can do immunostains uh, to try to sort them out. So you could use something like Melan A or Mart1 or SOX10, uh, which are melanocytic markers, to look and see if these are melanocytes. You could use a, a stain like Cytokeratin 7, which is a low molecular weight keratin that usually is negative in most squames and strongly positive in Paget's disease. Um, and then uh, for if you've ruled those things out, what you're usually left with is squamous cell carcinoma. Um, P63 is a good marker for, uh, for squame if you want to use something, or P40. But here's, uh, here's an easy clue to find that you're probably dealing with squame. If you have the full thickness of the epidermis filled by atypical cells, that's almost always, not always, but almost always going to be squamous cell carcinoma in situ. So if I just see an area with pagetoid spread, I, I often have to do immunostains. If I'm in the, the genitals or the nipple, or if I have any doubt about melanoma, then those are times where I'm going to do immunostains probably regardless, just to be sure. Um, but here you can see really nice example of squamous cell carcinoma in situ with pagetoid spread. And notably, this is a, an example that has really prominent clear cell change. So these are probably glycogen-filled um, uh, squamous cells, and we can see this sometimes uh, uh, squamous cell carcinoma can become clear cell. You can also see clear cell change in basal cell carcinoma and a wide variety of other tumors. And uh, this tumor is not actually limited only to the epidermis, which would make it in situ, but if you look down underneath, you can see all these areas are islands of invading tumor that's invading the dermis. Quite sneaky here because the tumor is so pale, it would be easy to overlook this and just think it's all reactive stuff. So anytime you see spindle cells and a little bit of mucin and some inflammatory response underneath uh, an in situ tumor, always look closely to make sure that you're not dealing with invasion. So this is this is the, the, the this kind of stuff around here is a kind of desmoplastic response by the body against these invading cancer cells. And see, there's a little island of cancer here. Uh, this is cancer here some cancer here involving a sebaceous gland. So it can be very, very tricky to see. And if you have any, uh, any problems with it, you can do a keratin or again, a P63 or P40 to look for the invasive, uh, subtle invasive component in, uh, in a uh, squamous cell carcinoma like this. So again, beautiful example of clear cell squamous cell carcinoma. This is the in situ area. We just saw the invasive area. And then again, this also has some cells with that upward scatter. So what we call pagetoid. Uh, spread. So a nice example of several different uh, features here in this unusual pattern of squamous cell carcinoma. All right. Here's kind of a, an oddity, but it's something I like. Uh, this is on the scalp, and this is from a patient with a, uh, a nevus sebaceous. So they've had this kind of greasy, uh, yellowish, uh, hairless plaque on their scalp since, since childhood, and it's gotten bigger over time. And uh, nevus sebaceous is kind of a benign hamartomatous process, but sometimes a variety of different tumors can grow in the middle of it, particularly skin adnexal tumors like hair follicle or sweat gland tumors. And so uh, this right here is an area that started to grow and eventually uh, kind of crusted 
and started to bleed. So they were worried that maybe there was cancer arising in it or something. So they went and did a biopsy. And here what you see is on the outside, you can see this epidermal acanthosis and thickening. That's probably partially reactive change and partially the background nevus sebaceous. But here in the middle, you can see that the color changes to a darker purple and we have something else going on. There are these little branching spaces that are kind of pushing their way down into the dermis. And when you go closer, you can tell that what the spaces actually are is ducts. So see here in, in these areas, they become very similar to sweat ducts. They are have a, a lumen, a, a empty space in the middle that actually has a little bit of pink sweat secretion in it. So these are sweat ducts here and they are lined by a double layer of cuboidal to columnar cells. See, there's kind of an outside, um, oops, I'll move down a little bit. It's kind of an outer uh, basal or myoepithelial layer and then an inner apical layer. And then there's that secretion in the lumen. So go, that's what the, when they get kind of compressed at the base, they look like sweat ducts. But as they go up, you can see that they become dilated and they kind of branch and they eventually empty all the way out onto the skin surface. See, there's the surface of the skin and then there's a bunch of scale and crust and, and kind of debris up there. So these dilated kind of uh, frond-like uh, branching um, spaces that are lined by a double layer of cuboidal to columnar epithelium and are of sweat duct derivation, that's one feature. And when you have these uh, branching spaces, what happens is in the middle, you get little um, islands, little finger-like uh, projections of tissue that get kind of caught in the middle. And when we cut through it, it looks like they're little stranded islands. They're actually like little papillary structures, but pap papillae, when you cut through them, um, on, a, on a tissue section, they end up looking like little islands. So these little islands or papillary structures here are stranded in the middle of these cleft-like, uh, or these uh, frond-like branching spaces. And in the middle, the, uh, the middle of the island, this is basically the dermis, uh, little, little islands of dermis caught in the middle of these uh, papillary structures, you can see that there's a bunch of inflammatory cells. And particularly these cells are, let's see if I can get them in focus, plasma cells. They have a very kind of amphiphilic bluish purple cytoplasm. They have that very speckled kind of uh, clock-like or cartwheeling, or there's a lot of different names for it, uh, chromatin pattern. This very, they're like little purple blobs here at each nucleus. It's hard to get it in focus at this power, I apologize. We'll go up maybe to 40X. Let's see, ah, yeah, you can see the chromatin better here. So there's little, those little speckles um, or people think they look like the numbers around the face of a clock. Those are characteristic of the chromatin pattern of plasma cells. And then the other thing that you'll see in plasma cells, if we get a good section, is that they tend to have this little pale, um, pale uh, nodule or this little pale area right next to the nucleus. And uh, that's called the perinuclear Hof. And it's um, a Golgi apparatus that is needed to to uh, transport all the immunoglobulins the plasma cell is making out into the uh, body so that it can be, um, it can be uh, released into the circulation. So anyway, there's tons of tons of plasma cells here in the, of the, in the middle of these islands. And so you have those uh, frond-like spaces, double cuboidal lining, and a bunch of plasma cells. This is called syringocyst adenoma papilliferum. That's a long name, so we call it SCAP. S-C-A-P. SCAP is an easier way if you uh, if you don't mind using an abbreviation. But syringocyst adenoma papilliferum is a benign um, sweat gland proliferation that um, often arises on the scalp in the middle of a nevus sebaceous. So uh, kind of a cool pattern and um, an interesting thing to know about. Now, here is a biopsy. This is a, a child who has uh, multiple hyperpigmented uh, papules on their trunk and they're very itchy. And uh, so the dermatologist did a biopsy here and there's a little keratin granuloma down here from a ruptured follicle, but that's incidental. But what we're most interested in is that the dermis here is not normal. It's filled with some type of cell. So we gotta go closer to see what kind of cells these are. And they're kind of a oval to spindle shaped cells and they're mixed in with a lot of pink collagen. And you can see that they're totally uh, within the dermis. They do not involve the epidermis at all. And in mixed in between these kind of oval to spindled cells, see here's these kind of oval to spindle cells, 
And then there's also a bunch of um, bright pink or orange eosinophils scattered in there. All right. So whenever we see an infiltrate in the dermis and then eosinophils and it's a child, we always think about Langerhans cell histiocytosis. That's one thing. The one difference is that Langerhans histiocytosis usually is going to involve the epidermis. It's going to get up into the epidermis because Langerhans cells normally live in the epidermis. They're, they're built to get into the epidermis. Um, but this infiltrate is full, filling up the dermis and not involving the epidermis. And then when you look closer at the cytoplasm of the cells, what you can see is they have a very finely granular uh, texture to them. It can be a little hard to appreciate on video, but let's see if we can get it to show up. See, they have this kind of slightly bluish um, cytoplasm that is falling apart there and has kind of a granular nature to it. So I think when I see cells like that, I always think about mast cells. They have these bluish, bluish granules in their cytoplasm. So mastocytosis is also something that can occur in children and can uh, make multiple itchy papules like we just described. And so what we did is some stains to make sure so the one stain that you can do for mast cells is a CD117 or C-Kit. Now, word of caution, C-Kit will stain mast cells beautifully, but it's not specific. It will stain a lot of things. Melanocytes and lots of other things can be positive for C-Kit. And here's a, here's a beautiful example. There's strong, diffuse staining of all of these mast cells in the dermis. Beautiful. Very nice. You can also use mast cell tryptase, which is a little bit more specific. So that, that works pretty well too. Or you can even use a geme sustain, which will highlight them. But wait, what about these uh, CK7 positive cells up here in the epidermis? I, we said that there were no cells in the epidermis. See, these are background melanocytes, normal melanocytes um, that are in the background of the skin. So again, remember that normal melanocytes and a lot of melanocytic lesions will express CD117. So you gotta be careful. But here we have diffuse, strong staining of the dermal cells for CD117. And we also did a CD1A and an S100 protein, which are stains for uh, Langerhans cells. And you can see, sorry, the section's upside down. The, these uh, cells in the middle of the epidermis, those are actually Langerhans cells there. And then the ones along the base of the epidermis, those are melanocytes. So those both express S100. So we've got a nice, normal, positive internal control. But the dermal cells are almost completely devoid of S100 staining, with the exception of scattered cells here and there. And those also represent Langerhans uh, and other dendritic cells uh, in the background. But this is, it's totally normal to have a little scattered staining in the dermis for almost anything, actually. Um, and, but the rest of the infiltrate, all those cells that were C-kit positive, um, are negative on S100. Or I'm sorry, on, on the, that, excuse me, that was, uh, that was actually CD1A. So I miss, oh no, it was S100. And then here we have, uh, here we have CD1A. Uh, and that, you can see beautifully those, that basal layer of, um, basal layer um, melanocytes, the normal background melanocytes are not staining, but the, the mid-level cells in the epidermis, those are staining and those are the Langerhans cells. So S100 will stain Langerhans cells, but also melanocytes and some other things, whereas CD1A pretty much only stains Langerhans cells um, in the skin. That's about the only thing that it stains, both normal and um, neoplastic uh, Langerhans cells. So this is a real nice example of uh, cutaneous mastocytosis and the form that uh, this child had with the kind of a itchy hyperpigmented um, papules and nodules, that's called urticaria pigmentosa, which is kind of a confusing name because it microscopically doesn't look anything like urticaria. But in any case, that's, um, that's a nice example of that. And uh, I usually let the um, dermatologist make the, the clinical distinction between the different subtypes of mastocytosis um, because they, uh, the clinical um, picture is much more important for, for classifying which type of mastocytosis it is. So let's try our hand at one or two inflammatory uh, dermatoses here. So here's a shave biopsy. It's a very broad shave. And you can see that the, the epidermis normally would be kind of like that, but here the epidermis gets really thickened. And it's not the whole epidermis that's thickened, but just individual areas. That's thick, that's thick, that's thick, that's thick. So we have these areas of really marked acanthosis. And then in between, uh, the epidermis is kind of more or less normal in thickness. And on the surface, there is a lot of thick keratin, and most of it's orthokeratin, meaning it lacks uh, nuclei. You see there's a few little bits of nuclei here and there, so a bit of perikeratosis, but really it's kind of this dense, compact orthokeratin. And look at these dilated blood vessels here. This is a clue to us that we're probably on the lower leg, and that's where we are. This is actually from the shin. Patient has these plaques that are very itchy on the anterior shins. 
So this, uh, these vessels are called stasis change. It's just from uh, gravity uh, related uh, blood flow pushing back down on the blood coming up from the legs and it makes these kind of uh, reactive proliferation of capillaries. So we see that all the time. It's kind of a normal variation. As people get older, they get more and more of st this stasis change. And um, so it, whenever you see it though, these little clustered capillaries in the papillary dermis, useful clue even without being told that you're probably on the lower leg. So sometimes on exams, it's really helpful to be able to tell um, the clinical information by knowing those little background clues, even if you're not given the information. And then also in real life, it's helpful because sometimes, uh, you know, things get mislabeled and, and once you see, you realize, oh wait, this can't be from the scalp, it has to be from the lower leg. And then you can go investigate and see what's going on and why, why the, the label is switched up. So look down at the, uh, when we look down here at the base of these, um, these uh, areas of acanthosis, we can see that there's a band-like infiltrate made of a dense band-like infiltrate of lymphocytes kind of hugging along the bottom of the epidermis. And it's most predominantly noted at the, the tips of these acanthotic regions. And when we go even closer, we can see that this is actually a lichenoid infiltrate. It's not only a band of lymphocytes, but it's a band of lymphocytes that's kind of chewing up and destroying the basal layer. So normally there's a real clean division between the basal keratinocyte layer and the uh, dermis, and that's the, that's the basement membrane. But here the basal keratinocytes and basement membrane are being destroyed by the lymphocytes. And what's being left behind are these little bubbles, these vacuoles. We call those vacuolar change or liquefactive change. And then little pink blobs, which represent dying keratinocytes. See, there's a little pink blob there. So you can call them cytoid bodies or uh, savat bodies. There's a bunch of different names for them, but they basically represent dying keratinocytes that are, are dying here because of the lymphocytes that are attacking the basal layer. So again, see, dying keratinocyte, you can even see its retained nucleus there. You can see all these vacuoles and you can tell that the line between the dermis and epidermis is very blurred and difficult to distinguish. So that's a, the definition of, um, of an interface change and when there's interface change with a thick band of lymphocytes we call that lichenoid interface dermatitis. So here on the anterior lower legs itchy plaques and uh, papules and nodules that um, are uh, have a really thick acanthotic epidermis and then a band like lichenoid infiltrate underneath this is called the hypertrophic variant of lichen planus. So hypertrophic lichen planus is usually on the lower legs and it usually has not only a lichenoid band, but also these little kind of skipping areas of really thick acanthosis. So that's a really useful finding, I think, that you go have acanthosis and then not that much acanthosis. And then there's more acanthosis and then it kind of skips. So I find that really helpful and that you have interface change and lichenoid change that's most prominent down at the tips of these elongated acanthotic reedy. And one other thing that's a little different in hypertrophic lichen planus that's different from regular lichen planus is that you can see eosinophils and plasma cells. Those are usually not very abundant in regular lichen planus, but we often see them in the setting of hypertrophic lichen planus. So there's an eosinophil right there, and here's a plasma cell. See his little pink perinuclear hoff there. So that's, um, that's a really nice example of hypertrophic lichen planus. And occasionally they can present as kind of solitary lesions on the lower legs and not be as diffuse and rash-like and uh, will get biopsied because uh, they can mimic a basal cell carcinoma or squamous carcinoma uh, clinically. So a real nice example, hypertrophic lichen planus. And then here's a punch biopsy. And this is from the abdomen. And this is an area of kind of thin, atrophic looking skin that's kind of thin and papery. And what you can see is there's a definite abnormality here in the superficial uh, layers of the dermis. The epidermis, for one thing, is atrophic. Now, how do we know it's atrophic? Atrophic means it's thinned or decreased in the number of cells present. Well, you don't have to go and count the layers of the cells or anything like that. All you have to do is recognize that there are no reedy ridges. Normally, there are reedy ridges in skin that extend down from the epidermis, but here the epidermis is totally flat with a, an absence of reedy. So when I see that, that means that the skin is atrophic. Um, either because it's been injured before, like a scar over, over a scar, you'll see atrophy like that usually, or because there's some sort of a, a uh, underlying process that's causing it to become atrophic. And here, it's the, the latter situation where you have an underlying inflammatory process. And what you can see is there's this dense band of re really dense pink sclerotic hyalinized looking collagen. Look at that. Just totally smudgy pink 
that's what you mean by hyalinized. It's this kind of smudgy, glassy looking pink that's very homogenous. And it's, it's not as easy to see down here in the deeper dermis, you can see individual pink collagen bundles. Up here, those collagen bundles are all smushed together. And if you flip the condenser, you can kind of get the, uh, you can kind of see the collagen bundles better. There still are collagen bundles up here, but they're packed really closely together and they're hard to tell apart. Down here, you can see the normal reticular dermis. And what divides this uh, sclerotic zone at the top that's replaced both the papillary dermis and the upper portions of the reticular dermis, what divides that sclerotic zone from the, the more normal dermis down beneath is this band of lymphocytes. So there are a lot of lymphocytes in here. Sometimes you can see some plasma cells as well and some histiocytes. There's some histiocytes. And what's happened here is that this process started as an interface dermatitis up at the skin surface. Let's see if I can show you. Ah, see? There are still some little vacuoles. So kind of like the lichenoid change I just sh showed you in hypertrophic lichen planus, this started as a lichenoid process early on. But, it, but what happened then, unlike lichen planus, this process, the inflammatory change moved away from the epidermis and kind of burned its way down through the dermis, kind of like, you know, destroying the dermis as it went. So uh, the inflammatory change started up here and you can still see those little vacuoles that are left over from where it started. And as it pushed its way down, it left kind of a wasteland of hyalinized sclerotic collagen behind it as it marched further and further south into the dermis. And so this is called lichen sclerosis. And in the older days, people often called it lichen sclerosis et atrophicus or LSA. We often just call it lichen sclerosis now. And uh, it's one of those many diseases in dermatology that has the lichen name, and those can be quite confusing because they have, uh, don't always show uh, lichenoid change microscopically. But anyway, this is one that often does start lichenoid, but by time it's biopsied, usually the lichenoid um, infiltrate is much, much deeper down, but it's left this very distinct band of pink collagen. So the most common place to see this is in the uh, genital region, and uh, particularly of women, but you can also see it um, um, on the penis where it's called uh, balanitis zerotica obliterans is the fancy name for it there. And then you can also see it in um, extra genital sites like in this case, which is on the abdomen. So this is lichen sclerosis atotropicus and it can be a, kind of a problematic and uncomfortable uh, disease to have, particularly when it's in the genitals. But it's an inflammatory process and it has a very distinct look once you've seen it a few times and recognize that band of pink collagen, uh, you'll remember it forever. So those were some basic uh, random dermatopathology cases and I hope you enjoyed.